In September 2022, I introduced to the world one of my favorite creations, custom 3D printed trains for Connect Screaming Serpent style track. These trains have several advantages over the stock trains that come with the Connects kits. My trains, I've named the Wildcat, allow for more realistic and modern ride layouts. Additionally, using ball bearings as wheels allows for them to maintain their momentum better and gives them a really pleasing sound as they roll down the track. After I released that video, I started to notice a couple issues while experimenting with them. You may be able to spot a few modifications I made if you pay close attention. The focus of this video isn't related to the minor modifications. I'll save those for another time. This video is focused on a big project I mentioned at the end of my last video. I'm going to break my roller coaster. More specifically, I'm going to build a magnetic braking system into my Kinex roller coaster and I'm going to share with you the 6 month journey to get to this point. Before I released the first video on these trains, I had already built a smaller coaster to test them with. Originally, it was meant to sit on my desk and not take up much space. This was the coaster that was shown in the last video and it's grown significantly since then. Building this allowed me to put the trains through their paces and progress them further, but I kept finding myself in need of a way to stop them at the end of the test. They take nearly 4 days of printing and cost 2 to 3 times the amount the stock trains are being listed for on eBay. Having them smash into something or just fall off the track is not a great way to stop them. I only have one 3D printer and its time is valuable. Time is reprinting broken parts is time it could be printing new ideas. But this project wasn't just a hobby project, it also became an academic project too. Fall 2022 was my final semester of my undergrad coursework and I was taking a mechatronics technical elective. For this class, every student was required to create some form of mechatronic system by the end of the semester that, at the very least, had to show personal growth, but ideally would work too. I thought it would be fun to combine a hobby project and an academic project, but this meant I need to have something somewhat functional by December. Or at least I had to show I learned something. No problem. What were you thinking? For my project, I went to create the magnetic braking system for my coaster. Magnetic brakes don't require any power and provide a non contact braking force. Magnetic brakes aren't actually able to stop a train completely, and this challenge is where I plan to integrate it into my coursework. The brakes would be set up to slow the train most of the way, then I would use wheels in the track to completely stop and hold the train. Wait, what? They can't stop a train? Nope, they can just slow it down. Well, actually it sort of depends. Here, let me explain. Magnetic brakes are a deceptive name. You may think that there would be a magnet on the track and a magnet on the train and they would pull towards each other. This would theoretically work on a small scale. The issue here is that the magnets aren't really doing the braking. They would apply an additional load to the trains, then the added friction between the track and the wheels would slow it down. This isn't ideal because added loads would reduce the lifespan of the track, the trains, and the wheels. The technical name for magnetic brakes are eddy current brakes. Eddy currents are formed in the conductive brake fin which produce a force opposite to the direction of travel. Here, let's back up a little bit. You may recall that moving a magnet past a coil of wire creates a voltage in that coil. This is a pretty basic science experiment and is how generators work. The principle of how this works is Faraday's law of induction. According to this law, a voltage is equal to the number of turns of wire in the coil multiplied by the changing magnetic flux over time. Magnetic flux being the amount of magnetic field passing through a defined area. If we were to replace that coil of wire with a plate of electrically conducting material, it turns out that a voltage is still induced, and that current forms its own coil. This is called an eddy current. When a current passes through a conductor, it creates a force whose direction is determined using the right hand rule. It's the opposite of what we just talked about, and it's how basic motors work. 
proper eddy currents, they create a force opposite to the direction of travel that created them. That's the braking force. Let's apply this base knowledge to a roller coaster. We'll mount a set of magnets parallel to each other on the track and a conductive fin to the train. To increase our flux, we'll arrange the poles of the magnets so that they face a conductor. Then, let's space the magnets apart so that the fin can pass through without touching them. As the train moves and passes through the magnets, a changing magnetic field is created in the fin. This changing magnetic field creates a current that loops inside the fin. This current then forms its own magnetic field that creates a force opposite to the way of travel. This is how magnetic brakes work. Let me introduce to you the formula driving my designs. This formula can be used to get a rough estimate of the braking force of a linear eddy current brake. For this formula, B is the magnetic field, A is the area of the fin, sigma is the electrical conductivity of the brake fin, T is the thickness of the fin, and V is the velocity of the train. Going back to our problem from earlier, this explains why they can't stop a train. If your velocity is zero, then there isn't a changing magnetic flux and your braking force is zero. On a section of flat track, this isn't as big of an issue. The trains will slow to a stop, but the brakes will lose its force and the train is free to move again. On an incline, it'll only slow a train to a crawl until it passes through. Therefore, we need a way to hold the train in place so it can't move. This is why magnetic brakes are also paired with friction brake devices. Okay, I know that's a lot to take in, and I acknowledge I skipped over a ton of details. If you'd like to learn more about eddy currents, then I suggest watching this video by Electroboom on the subject. I decided to start designing brakes with the most complicated part, the trains. The challenge I was facing was where to put the brakes. My trains have a fair bit of extra links and mechanisms under them to give them their extreme maneuverability. Additionally, I need to leave some space under the train for the chain on the track. Between those two things, there's simply no room under the train for any extra parts. That's why I decided to mount the brakes on the side of the train. The next question is what exactly I would mount to the trains. In the real world, some coasters mount the magnets on the train and some mount the brake fins on the train. For the purposes of creating a less bulky design, I chose to put the brake fins on the train. As for what that fin is, I had another decision to make. Going back to the equation, a higher electrical conductivity is going to be better. The logical first thought was to use copper. I once do that, but copper is more expensive and I couldn't really find it in the shape I needed. To keep up with my project schedule, I needed something that I could get fast so I could start experimenting with it. Also, saving money is a nice bonus. I found this aluminum bar for under $5 at the hardware store to use instead. Aluminum has a slightly lower electrical conductivity, but it's a little bit lighter and far less expensive. I cut two strips of aluminum, drilled some holes, then mounted them to a modified train body. The body itself is pretty basic, and it's mostly there just to hold the brake fin in place. Since the bodies are the only modified parts needed for the brakes, the trains are still compatible with coasters built without braking. And now I have trains ready for brakes. The next decision is how to mount the magnets to the track. I knew I needed to mount pairs of magnets parallel to each other and they would hang off the side of the track. These magnets would need to be a set distance apart and the magnets need to have their poles facing perpendicular to the brake fin. I initially intended to use Connect's track with custom parts, but this idea was short lived. The issue with this approach is that I didn't have a great way to model parts around the Connect's parts. There exist models of Connect's parts online I can use, but they aren't perfect. It's like trying to design a bridge without knowing the depth of the water under it. So I decided to make my own track. This track is something that I want to go more in depth with in a future video and it's still a work in progress. Starting this project gave me the chance to experiment with some ideas I had for it. Dimensionally, it's exactly the same as a tube track from Kinex. The main difference is that my track is more rigid. The rails are attached to a spine with a familiar shape. 
The rectangular spine gives me a fantastic service to mount brakes and other track mechanics to. I designed these L-shaped brackets that can screw into the track. Each bracket allows for four pairs of magnets to be mounted on one side of the train. These magnets are in a carriage that holds two pairs. These carriages screw into the L-shaped bracket and I can adjust their height so that the brake fins can pass through without touching. Choosing the magnets was another consideration that took some time to make. If we go back to that formula for braking force, you'll notice that there's just one value for magnetic flux. However, we can get a rough estimate for the magnetic flux using this formula. Yeah, this thing isn't fun to calculate by hand, but the biggest thing to take away is that a larger magnet closer to the brake fin will give a larger magnetic flux. My first set of magnets were small rectangular magnets glued into the carriages. These were too small and really didn't provide much of a braking force. Additionally, gluing them is a messy and tedious process and is not worth the added hassle. The next set were larger round magnets reused for my first project, Rocket Run. I purchased these from Harbor Freight and after doing some testing I found that these magnets work fantastic. The issue with these is getting the quantity I need was going to be challenging. Guess it's not every day someone buys 40 magnets from Harbor Freight. I settled on these slightly larger magnets from Amazon. These were a better deal altogether as the price per magnet was significantly lower. Additionally, since they are slightly larger, they produce a slightly larger braking force. These are then pressed into the plastic carriages without me needing to glue them. 24 hours of printing later, and my magnets are taken care of. With the biggest challenges overcome, it was time to design the layout of the brake run. As mentioned before, magnetic brakes can't fully stop and hold a train, and they need to be paired with a friction brake device. With this limitation in mind, you'll generally find there are two styles of implementing magnetic brakes into a roller coaster. The first is using the magnets to bring a train to a near or complete stop then drive tires are used to stop and hold the train in place. These tires can also be used to propel the train forward when the ride is ready. The second has the magnets being used to trim the majority of the speed off a train. Then, a friction brake device, such as pinch brakes, are used to bring it to a stop and hold it still. I've decided to take an in-between approach. I'm going to have the magnets do the majority of the braking on the length of flat track. After most of the speed is taken away, I'll push some of the magnets away from the brake fins, allowing the train to coast onto some wheels in the track. The wheels will pull the trains into the proper parking spot and stop the trains. Pushing the magnets away will ensure the train will still have just enough momentum to pass onto the wheels. The setup is similar to how the brakes are set up on Millennium Force at Cedar Point. With the mechanics determined, it was time to figure out the electronics and complete the project, starting with moving the brakes. Moving the brakes out of the way was something I wasn't sure how I was going to do. I could have taken the easy route and used a servo to rotate a cam and push it out of the way. However, if a servo was to lose power, then it stays in that position. So if it was to lose power while the brakes were open, then they would stay open, which is unrealistic. Real roller coasters, if they lose power, automatically close their brakes so that they can stop a train in motion. I chose to use a micro push-pull solenoid. Unlike a servo, when they lose power, they spring back to their closed position. They work by passing a current through a coil of wire, and this creates a magnetic field. This is essentially shorting out a current source and they draw a fair bit of power. But this energy has to go somewhere and in turn they get hot. Fast. It takes about 30 seconds of continuous use to soften the PLA supports and permanently damage them. I don't expect that they'll need to be powered for this long, but I can't guarantee it'll never happen. So that means I need to cool them. No problem. I'll simply put a small dab of thermal paste onto the solenoids and attach the heat sink with a zip tie, applying constant pressure. Nah, I'm kidding. 
This computer fan blowing at them will work perfectly. I'm sure there are ways to prevent the overheating issues by modulating the power to them, but this is the easier way. I printed this mount that holds two solenoids. The two solenoids push on a modified L bracket. To spring the magnets back, I used my teenage nemesis, rubber bands used for braces. These bands are really cheap and are fairly springy for their size. After some adjustment to the printed parts, applying a voltage to the solenoids pushes the brakes out 4 millimeters, then turning them off springs them back into place. The wheels and the track were the final mechanical challenge I had to overcome, but it was something I pushed way too far back. Below each wheel sits a brushed DC motor with a small pulley attached to it. This pulley drives a belt wrapped around the center of the wheel. I reused a worn train bearing in the center of the wheel to provide a reduced friction spot for them to rotate on. Controlling the motors and solenoids is done with an Arduino Uno. Input is taken from the track using three Hall effect sensors to tell the Arduino where in the brake run the train is at. The first sensor will tell the Arduino that the front car of the train has made it through the magnetic brakes. It has been placed in such a way that most of the speed will have been taken by the brakes and it can coast onto the wheels. This will cause the solenoids to open and the first set of motors to turn on. The second Hall effect sensor is set up in a spot where the brake fins will have completely cleared the magnets. This will tell the Arduino to close the solenoids to help prevent them from overheating. The third sensor turns off both sets of motors and sets the Arduino into a waiting state. When I finish the coaster, I can attach it to another Arduino running a blocking system to set the entire brake run up as a block brake. The motors I chose to use are basic brush DC motors. To control them, I am using L293DH bridge. With all the technical details out of the way, it's time to get printing. I ended up printing for nearly two and a half weeks straight. I've got all the 3D printed parts put together, but the electronics still need to be assembled. I settled on powering the setup using a 20 volt drill battery and using some buck converters to step down the voltage for the Arduino motors. Soldering the control circuitry was fairly simple. I already had the circuit made on a breadboard for testing. All I had to do was transfer that and wire it to a prototype port. The power supply circuitry was also pretty simple. It's just a positive negative rail coming off the battery. 20 volts goes to the solenoids and the MOSFET that powers them. 9 volts goes to the L293D chip controlling the motors and 5 volts goes to the Arduino. To turn on and off the solenoids, I'm using a MOSFET on a separate board. When the Arduino signals to, the MOSFET acts like a switch to turn on the solenoids and the cooling fan. I also wired in a button I can press to manually open the brakes. The code was also pretty simple to make. The Arduino cycles through checking the values off the analog pins that the Hall effect sensors are connected to. When the train with a magnet gets close, those values will change. And once it crosses a preset threshold, it'll trigger one of the three functions of the Arduino. At this point in time, it was 7 a.m. on the day the project was due, and I had been working non-stop on this since 3 p.m. the day before. I had to leave for class in an hour and I still need to make a presentation. But first, I had to do a quick test run. I glued a magnet to the train and plugged in all the electronics. Then disaster struck. Because of the tight time frame, I don't have any pictures or videos of the test, but I can tell you exactly what happened. A small solder bridge was shorting out the 20 volt connections for the solenoids, shorting out the batteries that power the system. Lithium batteries are not something to take lightly. By shorting these two wires, I was shorting the battery, causing them to dump as much current into the wires as possible. What I should have done to prevent this was to wire a fuse in series with the positive terminal of the battery. Thankfully, I was watching it closely and was able to stop the test before it got out of hand. I chose the cheap and easy option to reuse wire and exclude the fuse, and I paid the price. 
I need to leave for class and present what I had. I've been up for 24 hours at this point, and I was ready to admit defeat. But I was given a second chance. See, we ran out of time on Tuesday before we got to my project, and my presentation was pushed back to Thursday, meaning I had another 48 hours to finish it. I repaired the melted wires, fixed the solder bridge, and plugged in all the Hall Effect sensors. It passed the initial smoke test, and putting a magnet near the sensors triggered the Arduino. Everything was starting to look good. The final part I needed was a spacer to hold the Hall Effect sensors in place. I started to print the night before I was to present the project and took the rest of the night to get some much needed rest. The next morning when I took the spacers off the printer, I found that they were slightly too tall and the train would hit them. This really frustrated me. I was able to get everything else working, but three spacers kept me from fully finishing the project. Thankfully, I was able to present what I had and did a demonstration of all the electronics working without a train. So that was it. I finished my final semester of my undergrad and this is where the project sat for a couple weeks. I graduated shortly after the project was due and then took some time to take a break from it. Fast forward to February 2023 and I had just moved to another state, started a new job and was ready to start working on the project again. Finally, here's the results of all the upgrades, printing, planning, designing, soldering, extinguishing, redesigning, and learning. I present Eddy Current Brakes on a Kinex roller coaster. All told, it took five months of work to get to this point. It cost about $150 in parts, not including parts I already had. Between the train upgrades and the actual parts for the brake run, I went through about one and a half spools of PLA. The cost and the effort was totally worth it. This is a project I wanted to do well before I even created the Wildcat trains. This was something I wanted to start in 2020 when I started my first big project. I also got to explore some other ideas I wanted to do, such as designing my own track. Thanks to everyone who has watched my last video and has given me the encouragement to continue this hobby. I really appreciate the fantastic feedback. And a special thanks to all the classmates and faculty at UToledo who saw it in December and encouraged me to take it to the next level and finish it. Thank you very much for watching. I've got some big plans for the next few months, so stay tuned for more modeled coasters.